Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be getting started in just a moment, okay? We bear, um, we uh, beg your um, indulgence.
these all for the same case? Yes, but I don't know. Does the case have a number? It does, but I can tell based on that address what we're talking about. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. It's going to be the notary dealer of Ladies and gentlemen, we'll get started now. Uh, my name is Bill Robertson, and last month the commission elected me chairman uh, and Ms. Jackson to my right, vice chairman, and Ms. McCullough as secretary. And uh, <clears throat> I want to give a, a note of thanks to Mr. Andrews for presiding over this commission over the past um, two years. Did a fine job and, and left some big shoes to fill. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming today. We have uh, several items on the agenda which we're going to go through. But first, uh, it's customary for us to start the meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance and a prayer. So if you are inclined to join us, please stand. Our prayer will be led by Ms. Jackson and the pledge by Mr. Andrews. Father God, we come to you with bow down heads and humble hearts, Lord. Asking you for little, but thanking you for everything. Lord, thank you for those that are here today. Lord, touch our minds and our bodies. Let this meeting be of you and only you, Lord. Lord, we know that there is so much going on in this world, but we thank you for everything. We thank you for letting us come into a new year, and we will come into this new year and be blessed as much as we possibly can and do your works. And these blessed we ask in your name. Amen. 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 Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have a, a few remarks to kick us off today. All of the cases on the agenda will be presented by Metropolitan Planning Commission staff, followed by a presentation by the applicant or reading of the applicant's written comments and questions, and questions by board members. Now, we have all nine in, in attendance today, and I appreciate y'all coming. <clears throat> written public comments that were received prior to the meeting will be read into the record as each case is called. Each public comment will be limited to three minutes of reading time. Once the time has expired, the reading of the public comment will discontinue. A written or verbal rebuttal statement from the applicant will then be read into the record if we have one. After hearing comments on each case, the board will then immediately deliberate and vote on that case before moving on to the next case on our agenda. All voting will be conducted by roll call to ensure accurate recording of the vote. 
in circumstances where additional information may be needed to be provided by the applicant in order for the board to make a decision the board may defer and continue the case to the next regularly scheduled meeting for subdivision cases deferral can only be considered if the app if the applicant agrees to have the case deferred in accordance with state revised statutes any member of the public may request a copy of the board's decisions on a particular case by contacting our office 673-6480 after 1 p.m. on Thursday, the day after our meeting, or by accessing, accessing our website, shreveportcaddompc.com. All of the board decisions are subject to appeal to either the city council or parish commission depending on the location of the property in question. Please note that it is your responsibility to contact the appropriate governing body about their procedures as related to the matter you're concerned with. We value your participation and appreciate your compliance with these guidelines. Our first item of uh, business um, is approval of the minutes of our meeting on December 14. Second. Moved by Mr. Andrews, seconded by Mr. Moss. Is there any discussion among the board members? Hearing none, please vote your machines. Mr. Director, I think I voted no by mistake. We're off to a great start. Oh yeah, we are. We, we can we can vote again because we're having some technical difficulties, and I think that the Cattle Parish Commission experienced the same difficulties um, yesterday in their work session. Uh, the votes will not appear on this screen. They will appear on this <coughs> screen though, uh, so the public will not be able to see how you voted. Uh, you have two options. You can. Do that or you can vote by hands vote okay uh, all in favor of approving the mo the minutes of the December meeting please raise your hand any opposed please raise your hand it's unanimous in favor those minutes are approved the first case is uh, number 22-14-SC I believe it is a preliminary plat approval for a 32 lot single family subdivision on Pine Hill Road and Desaline Street. And the planner is Mr. Ben Kobe. So Mr. Kobe, please uh, take the floor. And th at this time, Mr. Chair, and in, in this meeting, planners will not be able to present the cases if you would just ask for the applicant to come. At each case, please. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, is uh, someone here representing the development? And please note as you speak to the commission, we need your name, address, and uh, zip code. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Craig with Moore and Associates, 1324 North Hearn, Suite 301, Shreveport 71107, representing the developer. Uh, of course, I'll be Glad to answer any questions that the commission may have on this plat, but I will want to point out to you that <clears throat> just recently, today, some ownership issues have come up on this, brought, up, brought to our attention by property management at the city engineer's office. And due to those uh, issues, we're gonna pull these first eight lots out of this platting, those are existing already existing platted lots they were included just uh to coordinate it and con con consolidate it for the homeowners association but that's not, abs not absolutely necessary so because of the ownership issues those will be pulled so now it'll only be 24 lots uh and so i just want to let y'all know that when y'all see the final addition that those those will be pulled also there was some question about the driveways for the first two lots as you turn in at uh, the initial 
submission of the plat that uh, first lot which is now 1001 was going to be a residential lot but, but we need that for the stormwater detention there's a lift station on it other issues so that's going to be a common lot that, uh, non buildable so there won't be any driveway off of it and then uh, lot 31 is that that makes it about oh, uh, more than 65 feet from Pine Hill Road so shouldn't be any issues with the driveway uh, entrance onto it so uh, otherwise those are the, the only issues brought to our attention that we've addressed as Ben is there any is there any more to know of? So, okay but uh, we'll keep we'll keep Ben up to date on on that in fact he'll have a copy by the time he gets back up to his office most likely but uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions if y'all have any so mr. Craig just to be clear you're asking for approval of a 24 lot subdivision today oh what so a 24 you're, lot yes. you're asking for yep. approval of a 24 There's 32 lot as, subdivision. as you said and then we'll pull those first eight now lot lot nine is going to be a new lot but uh, because the initial platting of I don't remember what the name of that subdivision uh, original subdivision was but include lots one through eight as you see them on this plat and we're not changing the lots like I said they were just included just for a consolidation deal that's not necessary and so we'll with the ownership issues we will pull those out separately PhD global enterprises is the property owner yes okay they're not the developer yes they're a developer and they property are the owner developer. okay and, and can you tell us who that is uh, we've got some owners representatives here if you if you need to speak to them well I just want I'm asking if they're local people if what some okay I, I asked if they were local and I'm yes getting, they are local I'm yes. getting an affirmative yes. handshake from the uh, or head shake Terrell from Hall the and gentleman. Justin Palmer Terrell Hall is with Hall Builders and his partners Justin Palmer very good we had some questions at our work session at 1 30 about drainage can you address that in terms of the implications for the subdivision I will try uh, what, what questions came up on the drainage we uh, we've only just got started on the uh, street plans um, and so we, ha we haven't completed the design yet but we're not aware of any drainage issues we're, we'll be collecting the street and dumping into that detention basin that we'll we'll design on lot that 1001 it is pretty flat but uh, we've we've uh, that's not going to be a, uh, a problem we can't overcome so miss McCullough yeah that was my concern uh, off Devereaux Road Pine Hill Road I'm quite familiar with the area and I do know there's no there, drainage there in yeah, the there, area there's no flooding issues that I'm aware of there uh, it is flat so uh, there are some local you know we just got to handle the local drainage there and what we'll do is we'll all the drainage will go into the street we'll put it underground in the inlet into the drainage pipe and then out into the detention basin and I'm if I remember right it's all going to drain out the Pine Hill Road ditch okay well that was my biggest concern yeah. was drainage. just going by memory because so. they have problems over there with flooding I'm sorry so I can't hear you why I said there are problems over in the area with flooding so that's why I had a concern about you know what provision we're going to be made to address well, I, draining issues. Yeah, I, I assure you, us and the city engineer will address any of those that uh, that might come up. So, okay. But I'm not aware of any flooding there. Uh, it's a pretty small. It's just one street. It's a pretty small drainage area in there. There's not much we can do for existing problems, but we will make sure that uh, the, that our design will address any issues right in that area. So. Well, I know there's no drainage in the area, period. Ma'am? So there's no drainage in the area, period. Uh, we may have to do some uh, improvements to the ditch uh, to make sure that it does drain. We hadn't really quite got to that stage yet, but okay. uh, we will be working with the city engineer's office to make sure that, that we take over any of those, those problems. So. Well, that's what Mr. Clark explained. That's that's great. Great. Uh, on the new street and the existing street, if needed. Could you share with her that the... Uh, the subdivision would not be approved unless that's right. it's yeah. checked off by the city engineer. So yeah, the uh, city is an engineer, and the city engineer is an engineer, and they will have to agree that drainage meets the requirements of the city street board. Generally, the city engineer won't sign off on a plat until all those issues are addressed. The plans are are approved and the construction completed to their satisfaction. So, 
that'll be your assurance. Yeah, well, I would hope that, you know, for instance, we just had a, a big rain here recently this week. If maybe engineering could go in at some point and observe and look at and assess the area right after a real right. heavy rain, you know, not so much as when it's dry, but when it's actually soaking wet and actually looking at how the water is flowing. Okay. Okay. Thank you so kindly. Uh, Mr. Craig, I believe we've been advised that uh, the agenda is incorrect when it says final plat. That means it actually should be uh, described as a preliminary plat. And once the city engineer signs off on this project, uh, uh, you'll come back to us with a final plat. Yes. Sir. That's your understanding? Right. Uh, I, I suppose unless that's an administrative deal, I'm not, I'm not sure, sir. But uh, either the commission or the, we'll be before the commission or satisfy the staff to that effect. So. Great. Okay. Uh, if your remarks are concluded, I'm going to call for anybody who is here in favor of this project to speak at this point. Is anyone here who is opposed to the project who'd like to speak? Okay, members of the commission, it's time to deliberate and uh, cast a vote. Chairman, motion to approve. Second. Mr. Andrews offers a motion in approval of the preliminary plat. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Mills. Moss. Is there any further discussion? Moss. I'm sorry, Mr. Moss. Right. Dog on it. Many identities. Strike two. I'm getting one strike three. <laughs> <laughs> any further discussion by commissioners? Okay, it's time to vote your machines. Okay, let's, uh, let's cast a vote by hand. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. Anyone opposed, same sign. As reflected by the machine, a seven to one vote, Mr. Chair. Seven to one? Yes, sir. But we have nine members in attendance. Eight to one. Okay, let the record reflect that it was an eight to one in favor. Ms. McCullough in, uh, in, um, in objection. Okay. Next case is number 22-236-C. It's identified on the agenda as number seven. It is a zoning request by Mr. Lionel Padron, and the location is Merrick Street. Uh, my understanding is that this project is right off of Uri Drive and the uh, Uri Drive um, service road. And uh, Mr. Padron is requesting um, May I read to you his request, Mr. Chair? Beg pardon? May I read to you his request? Absolutely so. It. Mr. Clark, you've got the floor. Yes, sir. He submitted it to the office and he said that he would like to request a rescheduling uh, in his appearance. He is a transportation driver and he's unable to be here today to answer any questions that the board may have. So Mr. Padron is asking for a delay in He's the- He's asking for a defer and continue to the February 1st meeting. All right, would it be appropriate for us to ask the audience yes, if sir. anybody yes, is here yes. to speak on this matter? Yes, sir. I was just speaking because he will not be coming up. Okay, this is a rezoning of um, uh, three lots in the Stoner Hill neighborhood from uh, residential to um, commercial two. C2 for office space and Mr. Padron is not in attendance and so he's asked us to defer a decision but if anybody is here in favor or opposed it's the time now to speak so anybody in favor of this project would like to take the microphone anyone in opposition Okay, unless there are any commissioners, um, well, we have to take a vote to defer, do we not? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, let's uh, make let, a motion to defer. Second. Mr. Sater motions to defer this matter, given that the developer is not here. And uh, Ms. McCullough, I believe, is the second. Any further discussion? 
Okay, please vote these machines. Let's see if we can get them to work. Okay, it's not showing up on the big board here. The vote is nine to zero, Mr. Chair. Vote is unanimous to yes, defer. Sir. Okay, very good. This matter will be held over until the February meeting. Okay, we're ready to move on to the um, last item on the agenda. I'm sorry, not the last. Yes, no, not the number last. Eight. This is number eight. Mm -hmm. Case number 22-244-C. This is a zoning request by Jones Legacy Holdings, LLC. Uh, also the property owner. The location is 126 North Market Street. And the uh, uh, request is to uh, change the zoning from Industrial 2 to Commercial 3 to allow for a reception facility and outdoor dining establishment. Um, <clears throat> Is uh, anybody here representing the developer? Okay, no Jones. Uh, what is the um, what is the uh, 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 commission's? Um, uh, let me see. Is there anybody here on behalf of Mr. Jones? Is there anybody here in opposition to this matter? Okay. Uh, I'm going to entertain a motion to defer this matter until next so. month. Second. That's moved by Ms. Jackson. I'm sorry, Ms. McCullough. And second by Mr. Moss. Any further discussion? We're going we're gonna, to uh, hold this over until Mr. Jones can be here to represent this matter for us. Uh, no further discussion. Let's cast a vote. Vote yes is a vote to defer. Okay, looks like uh, 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 everybody voted yes to defer. So we're going to pass this motion, uh, this matter, on to the February meeting with a request to staff that they reach out to Mr. Jones and ask him to come. The vote was actually eight to one. It's eight to Chair. one. Eight to one. Was that one vote in? Yeah, there's a mistake. That was oh, okay. a, that's an, a mistake by Miss Jackson. She intended to vote yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm missing the. the. Okay. Uh, now we're moving on to the last item on the agenda, case number 22-215-C. It's identified as number nine on your agenda. This is a zoning request for uh, applicant Beechwood Residential, and the owner is the Notre Dame Development Site, LLC. And the location is 2932 Murphy Street, uh, a city block uh, bordered by Murphy, Arkansas, Ashton, and Alabama. Uh, this is uh, currently zoned R15, which is single family residential, and the request is to go to R3, which is multifamily residential. This matter was initially uh, brought up last month. The applicant was unavailable and asked us to delay a decision until today when she could make an appearance. And it's my understanding that uh, the representative from Beechwood is here. Um, can you step forward, please? Identify yourself and make your argument. All right. I think it's is it gonna okay I can get started good afternoon everyone my name is Wendy Daniels I am the president and CEO of Beachwood Residential we are a real estate development company specializing in mixed income housing I have over 20 years of development experience in this specialization. Thank you all for the opportunity to come today and present um, this rezoning request. Um, I'd like to break up the presentation into two parts. Um, the first part will focus on the mixed income concept, and the second part will focus on the physical development itself. I know there have been some questions around incomes and things like that, so I 
Forgive me if I'm explaining things that many of you already know, but this is for the benefit of people who don't quite understand all of the nuances around this financing. So many of us know that market rate communities um, have no income restrictions, no rent caps, in individual market rate communities are our general typical everyday apartment communities um, individuals and landlords can charge whatever they want to depending on how much people are willing to pay so if there god forbid there's a natural disaster and there's a high demand for housing a landlord could charge two thousand dollars three thousand dollars four thousand dollars whatever somebody is willing to pay they can charge that that's the essential difference between mixed income housing and market rate development. So if you think about, I know a lot of us are familiar with um, uh, rent restricted communities in New York where rents are extremely high, the um, rent restricted developments are highly sought after. That's the same essential concept around the mixed income communities. Oftentimes when we talk about mixed income, people, most of us are generally familiar with just public housing or projects where the difference in those developments is 100% of the individuals in those communities were classified as essentially very, very low income. So in today's time, if it was a new public housing community, those rents could be restricted. I mean, the incomes of the individuals there would be restricted to like $20,000 a unit per household. Everybody, 100% of the people in that development would be capped at a household income of let's say $20,000. As we know, many public housing developments are being demolished. There um, is research around the idea of concentrating um, extremely low income families in a community and that's no longer the ideal scenario um, for developments. So this, the difference in what we're proposing at the Notre Dame site is it's truly a mix of incomes. So we have a range of income um, restrictions that allows for a number of different um, household sizes, um, household income levels to live in this community. So at this development, if you think about the example I used for public housing, we have 5% of our units are restricted for individuals that would be at the 20% AMI, or 20%, uh, I'm sorry, 5% of our units would be restricted for families that made $20,000 a unit, um, a year, sorry, excuse me for that. 45% of our units would be capped at individuals making $33,000 or below. 30% of our units would be capped at individuals making $40,000 a year or below. And 20% of our units would be capped at individuals making $52,000 a year and below. The average salary from what I researched, the average, average salary of a certified teacher in Shreveport is $44,000 a year. A teacher with three, two children is eligible to live in this community. A teacher with one child would be eligible. A teacher that didn't have any children would be eligible. So this is really housing for working class families. It's just allowing for multi-tiered individuals to be able to live in that community. If we restricted our units at a higher income level, then that means that, um, let's say a pharmacy technician would not be able to afford the maximum rent in our community. So this financing allows us to set different income tiers to allow for a true mix of incomes. Um, when I think about the community I grew up in, the community I live in now, where my mother lived, my grandparents lived, those were mixed income communities. You had teachers, custodians, firefighters, everybody was able to live in a community together. So these are the same type of communities that we're um, attempting to develop. Um, research has shown that almost 50% of renters in Shreveport are rent burdened, where they're paying more than 30% of their income towards rent. I think part of what's happening is we are so accustomed to paying such high rents, we don't understand that we shouldn't be spending more than 30% of our overall income on housing. These developments, the financing we receive, allows us to be able to lower the rents to a level that's actually within the affordable range for families. So when people hear affordable housing, they think that means low income housing. It essentially just means housing that different individuals can afford. Ms. So, Daniel? Yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, please give us your address. Oh, I apologize. 1637 East Lakeshore Drive, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Baton Rouge. And um, Mr. Clark, we've got some time limitations that uh, apply here, do we not? Yes, we do. She would have. And, and they are 10 minutes for the main speaker? Yes, sir. And three minutes for everyone who comes after? And you do have the option as the city council and yeah. the parish commission has to a lot additional time. 
Very good. If you Continue, so Ms. Daniels. Thank well, you. Well, can we can we just move to extend our time now so she can get through the presentation? Let's cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay. Okay. Right. How much does anybody know how much time I have left at this point? You're at, you have four minutes and fifty. Left? Oh. And we just ate up some of your time. Okay, so, so I have five minutes. <laughs> um, I think one of the one of the my favorite quotes from my mentor who brought me into this industry talked about what people really are concerned about when we say mixed income housing is not mixing incomes. Really, we know you can actually mix incomes. It's a concern about mixing values, right? We don't want to live in a community with people with a different set of values from us. That's not tied to your income. We. I, we believe at Beachwood that regardless of your income, most of us want quality housing that's safe and decent. We want access to great health care. Those are all um, value systems that many of us share. The way that we can control the values of the people that move into this community is through property management. A lot of times when you see these blighted properties, slums, uh, heavy crime, it's a function of property management and not enforcing the same community values that we uphold. And we know that's important when you have a range of incomes. I've lived in a mixed income community, I didn't even know it was. Because the goal is you shouldn't know. Um, ultimately you're moving into quality housing. I don't know how much my next door neighbor makes and that's the same thought process in these developments. Okay, let me move quickly to the actual physical development. Let me get to... Okay, um, that's not... Great, but um, we understood when we um, started this development concept that it was inside of an existing single family community. I've developed properties like this before. We want to be highly sensitive to the type of buildings that we're putting into this neighborhood where we are not proposing to build an eight story or five story, three story building in the middle of this develop in this in the middle of this neighborhood. So what you will find is all of the units along the uh, perimeter of the property, so Alabama Avenue, Ashton Street, and Arkansas Street are single story buildings. They'll be duplexes, some quads, but they'll look like a single family home, and I'll show you an example um, of that as well. There are a couple of buildings inside the property that are two story, but there are only two, and those will be shielded by the single story buildings. This development, this is um, another development that I recently did in um, Shreveport. Um, in conjunction with the housing authority and their uh, consultant. I have some videos, but I'm not gonna get into that. Okay, so this is an example of the style of um, units that we're proposing to develop at this site. Again, it's a $17 million total project cost. Um, Beachwood, our, our mission statement is to develop communities that transform the lives of our residents, um, enrich the lives of our residents, and transform communities by developing housing of superior quality. We don't develop housing that you can tell is affordable housing or low income housing. We develop market rate housing that allows for a mix of incomes. And so the standards of our communities will look like this. We have, like I said, there's another de development here in Shreveport that we recently finished. The financing that we utilize actually has higher design standards than, than most market rate communities. So these are fortified gold, which means that they should be able to withstand um, natural disasters. It's energy efficient. It's um, caps in terms of the overall size of the, the units. So it's a high quality um, development. Lastly, we are, um, well not lastly, but I, I'll, I'll skip that. This, is, this development is in line with the 2030 master plan. We are proposing to do something on the site that wasn't called for um, in the overall Shreveport master plan. And one other thing I will say is this is just the first step to the process. We literally are just asking for rezoning right now. We don't have any full plans, any drawings. We had a community meeting. It was not well attended. We are happy to continue to have meetings with the community. We do not intend to come into the neighborhood and develop something that the community doesn't want to see. So we're um, welcome to a condition of the rezoning to be ongoing community meetings, a design charrette, a focus group before permits could be issued to ensure that the community is comfortable with the overall development that we're planning. Any questions or how do we, y'all wanna? Ms. Daniels, mm -hmm. um, you said you uh, previously have built some projects in Shreveport? So there, um, the, the Wilkinson Terrace site, the former public housing site across the street from that is Fairfield Estates. Um, it's a 12 unit development that I worked on with the Housing Authority and their um, their consultant. Here's a picture of it. That's the inside. You see his granite countertops. For some reason, my mouse isn't working, but it's actually a video that'll show you. You can see the inside of that unit. 
So it's beams, floors, it's 10 foot ceilings. I mean, this is the standard of the communities that we're developing. And how about some uh, projects in Baton Rouge? Yes, yeah, so I'm working. Can you work give us some names? So um, I'm working right now. So long story, I'm from Louisiana. I moved to Atlanta. I spent 15 years in Atlanta. I recently relocated back to, to Louisiana. Um, in 2017 so I'm starting to develop properties here but most of the development experience I have has been developing communities over the last 20 years in the Georgia area mm -hmm. so I'm working on another deal right now in Baton Rouge um, it's with the YWCA it's housing for um, domestic violence survivors It's 12 units is under construction right now tell us about the grant uh, issues so the financing is is and this is please if I get really high level yeah, I'm trying I'm gonna keep it high, as high level as I can but it's low-income housing tax credits and essentially like I said these communities cost the exact same that a market rate community costs what happens is you can get these tax credits through a competitive process and then an investor will buy those credits and they will give you the grant funds you need which allows us to charge a lower rent so we get equity through these tax credits that means that we have less debt on the property which means now we can lower the rents to a level that we can, um, that makes them affordable. So they're issued through the, low income, the Louisiana Housing Commission is who you get the tax credits through. And what does Beachwood contribute? I'm the developer. So right. I have to, I, I manage this process from start to finish, from the design to the financing, to through construction, through lease up, through property management. We're in the process from start to finish. And what is your relationship with the owner of the property? So Kyla's Temple is my development partner. So he's the current landowner. Um, you made a statement that uh, uh, the Notre Dame development, as mm -hmm. we'll call it, mm -hmm. uh, is in keeping with our master plan. Mm -hmm. I believe the staff has a slightly different opinion. Can we get a comment? No, we had the same opinion that I'll read it to you from the staff report is redevelopment of blighted and vacant properties in areas needing revitalization and quality housing to meet the diverse needs of households at all income levels and at all stages of the life cycle is directly quoted from the 2030 Great Expectation Master Plan. So this is a this is redevelopment of a blighted area. You see a school that's not the at the quality that the school once was, and it's blighted in, in concept because it's falling down. This is redevelopment in a blighted situation. My statement was in reference to this uh, sentence in your staff report, <coughs> as the proposed zoning district allows for more density than that outlined in the future land use designation, it is not entirely consistent. And we had talked about reducing the zoning request from the R3 to the R2 to address the density requirement and Ms. Daniels had submitted to <coughs> accepting the R2 zoning. <coughs> If you were to use existing zoning, Ms. Daniels, how many single family homes could you build on this property? I'd have to explore that. Um, it, the challenge is this financing is very expensive and when you get less than about 40 units, you can't make, I couldn't make the numbers work with this type of financing. So I'm not sure exactly how many units. We, we ran the numbers and that's how we got to the 60 um, because if we drop down below that, the cost of the financing um, is too expensive to do 20 units, let's say. We're, we're remembering that uh, it was close to 71 single uh, family dwellings uh, if they were all single family dwellings. So 60 versus 71. So you can't make it with single family uh, residential with traditional lots and grass and all that good stuff? No, I wouldn't be able to make, not this development concept work. The challenge is, and, and I'm sure y'all hear it time and time again, the cost of construction now is so expensive. And again, the financing that we utilize, legal fees are over $100,000. 
financing fees can range a hundred thousand like it's so expensive to actually utilize the tax credit development costs you have to be able to spread it across enough rental units to make the numbers actually work or else you can't you can't finance the development so which is why we are trying to um, accommodate the single family community with building building units that look like single family units however they're multi-family structures um <clears throat> what happens to the trees that are on the site now there are not very many trees i mean we will have an aggressive landscape plan but i don't there are not very many trees on the site if we have to look at trying to save some trees we can look at that and i think it's important to to note that we haven't for us we the first step is rezoning to see if we can move the development forward so we've already incurred quite a bit of cost just with the with the actual layout of the property acquiring the property this this is our first step and so once we know that we can get the rezoning because sometimes you'll move through having full development plans and, and running down a concept and then you can't get the property um, you can't get it rezoned and you've spent that money so we haven't gotten into full design yet at this point which is why I said it actually offers a great opportunity to have continued dialogue with the community. That's another thing we've done, where you go out and you design a project and the community says, well, we don't like what these buildings look like. And so we'd rather have the rezoning in place and then we can start working through what the actual full development concept is. Well, and not, not a concept, because we know it's gonna be 60 units, it'll be these duplexes, but we aren't at that level yet. Got a question. I know we have a room full of people here that want to talk and ask questions mm -hmm. and a bunch of board members as well so I'm going to shut up but I have one more question okay what about the existing school buildings that building we have not currently this is happening on the site um, in absence of the building we haven't thought through what happens to that building yet if it'll be redeveloped into senior housing or what the final concept will be for that for the school building so uh, your plan at the moment is to leave them in existence. Mm -hmm. it, we know it, it's a we know it's a historic facility. We haven't proposed to demolish the school. 1958. Yeah. Uh, board might be interested to know that Mr. Elberson's uh, <coughs> firm uh, designed this uh, school. Mm -hmm. 1958. Okay. Uh, any board members have questions for Ms. Daniels? Yeah, I have a question. I have a question. Dr. Tebow. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. So at the start of your presentation, you shared with everyone the income basis. Mm -hmm. Ms. Tebow, you need to speak up. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. Okay. Is that, is that good? Yeah. Okay, all right. So you said income less than 20000 and then you gave the high range of income. You said 50000 or less. You started at 20000 or less. You went up. You maxed out, and you said 50000 or less. or less. So okay. in actuality, the cap for qualifying to live here is less than fifty thousand. Is that correct? Um, as of today, let me let me can I, if I can pull up a chart, I think it would be helpful. But essentially, we'll have units set aside at thirty percent AMI area median income, fifty percent area median income, sixty percent of area median median income, and eighty percent of area median income for a family of four. 80% of area median income is $52,000. That changes every year. Sometimes it goes down, sometimes, primarily it goes up. Mm -hmm. I can't say exactly what the cap will be until the actual income, I can tell you what the, the limit is, it's at 80% AMI, but this property wouldn't even be, um, individuals wouldn't be able to move <laughs> into this development if it moved forward until 20, what are we, 23, 20, 25. So it would be based on what 80% AMI is in 2025 when those individuals are ready to move in. So right now, the highest income is $52,000. Okay, so my, my second question, and this is just based on equity mm -hmm. of income across, mm -hmm. the, across the board. So you, you have a cap mm -hmm. for those individuals who qualify. Mm -hmm. So based on your standard of living, the showing, how, how is the rent? stratified mm -hmm. is that based on income is it based on the model what makes the difference of the qualifying income so every here we go if can you see this oh it's not showing anymore so um, it's a rent schedule and it shows at the different AMI levels what the rent is right so a one-bedroom at the 20% AMI is $151 
a one bedroom for an individual at 80% AMI is $815. The, inc the rent is based upon the unit size and the income cap. So it's a range depending on what income tier that individual is at. Does that, do you yeah. have, I don't know if you have, if you can. If that, that makes sense. Okay. I, I guess I'm just trying to make sure. So there are different model homes and depending on the model home and what's inclusive, yeah. fireplace, no fireplace. Oh, no, 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 no. All of the units are the same. They're all the They're same. They're all the same. They all have, so we, regardless you're not, of the income, you're not allowed has to. has the same mm -hmm. apartment. So the yep. person who's making $50,000 pays the same amount of rent as the person who's They don't pay the same amount of rent. They pay a rent based on their income level that they're in. For the same apartment. For the same apartment. That looks the same. That looks the same. Okay. I just wanted mm -hmm. to hear you say that. Yes. It. That looks the same. Any other board members have any questions for Ms. Daniels? And can I say one thing to that? I think it goes back to what I said about a traditional apartment. When we move into apartments, most of the time the, the units are pretty much the same in an in a apartment community. So we don't draw a distinction if you're a lower income person, you aren't allowed to have the same level of, of amenities. You don't get a dishwasher, you don't have, you get a smaller unit. The, the units are, um, it's not it's not selective it's it's across the board it's a mix so it's no it's no difference in terms of the level of standard depending on what your income is i'm Ms. i'm just going to slightly disagree with that cuz i've had my life mm -hmm. in apartments <laughs> okay I, I thank god i've moved up from that but i do understand that based on the amenities mm -hmm. in apartment complexes in the same unit there is a variant of how much you pay for rent so I just and so that's what prompted that question, and then based on the income range that you and we can't charge more. We we're that's the diff, that's the problem. We we don't get to charge you more because it's a better. We're capped at how much we can charge you in rent, regardless of what your apartment looks like. Okay. So that's the difference. Miss McCullough. Um, I guess what I, I what I, my concern is, you know, I've had some experiences with tax credits and uh, housing. And I expressed it in our work session that, um, you know, um, you say low income, middle income, high income, but, you know, especially with our low income, you know, if I'm not used to living in a house, um, what we don't want to do is say, hey, you know, we need some new housing in the area. And what we don't want to do is bring in low quality housing. Example, and housing that I was familiar with was built with, you know, substandard lumber, you know, untreated lumber. The distance between the houses, you know, it wasn't like it should have been. Uh, no sidewalks, no doorbells. I support um, new developments in the community. Uh, and especially when it comes to low income, middle income. And I guess what I want to say to Beachwood Residential, we don't, we, don't, we don't get excited over it looking new. We want it to be of good quality when you bring it to us. So, uh, and I understand from our director that all of this comes under the auspice of the engineering department. And so, through our city council, you know, we need to make it known that this is what we so desire. And like I said, based on my experiences, over 90% of the tax credits that came in the state of Louisiana, and we have 64 parishes in the state of Louisiana, over 90% 90, 90 of the tax credits came into the Martin Luther King community. At the end of the day, uh, Capitol Hill, as far as Capitol Hill, that was illegal, too much density in one community. And at the same time, when the vote fell on the city council, it came through, overwhelming opposition. Went to Louisiana, a uh, Baton Rouge. People, they opposed it. Associations opposed it. Our ministers opposed it. We packed out this chamber. Um, they had to put, put, put us out because there was so many people in here in opposition. But at the end of the day, the vote fell 
actually 6-0 with one councilman out of the chamber. So I guess based on that ex my experience, when I hear tax credit, you know, it doesn't sound good in my ear because I know, you know, what happened back in 2004, 2007, and just uh, about a year ago, uh, re a flood that we had on television, you could actually see the people going in the neighborhood, bringing people out of their homes in boats because the, the drainage was so bad. They couldn't even get out of their homes because their homes were flooded. So yes, I want new developments for, you know, for the city of Shreveport. But I don't like the fact that if we're of low income, you know, our developers are feeling like they can come in and drop, and please forgive me, crap on us because it looked new. Uh, we're past that now. We want quality housing, you know. So um, that was my biggest concern. Um, so I would hope that if, if this, uh, well, actually, I'm not going to support it today. But I would hope in the future, if it comes through, that you all would consider not just housing, that it looks pretty, they all look alike, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's not a, it's, it's no good. You know, at the end of the day, you're pulling our people out of their houses in boats because they can't get out. So bring in quality housing, if that's what you're really interested in. I hear you say you're from Atlanta. I'm from and Baton Rouge. I'm from Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge, but yeah. you've been, you've done housing in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some housing in Atlanta, and it's very nice. I mean, I like what they're doing in Atlanta. But what I cannot appreciate, and that's where I'm headed, is you proposing something that look pretty, freshly painted, you know, that's not of good quality. And I feel that our community you know, we're being taken advantage of because we are of low income and what we have is the lavadated and raggedy. So if I come here and I build something and I make it look new, you're gonna get excited. Oh, we got some, and then it's no good. So I'm asking Beachwood Residential, if you get in, <coughs> bring us good quality housing. I can assure you that I have the same um, standard of quality housing and I would love to Tour you on the in the development that we recently completed, so you can see it. I will tell you, most of our communities average about 175,000 to 200,000 per unit in develop in, in development costs and construction costs. So, this I don't um, LHC now under their new leadership, they've even increased the construction standards. Like I said, they, it's called fortified gold or something. It's something brand new. So it's it's costing us even more now to develop at that level. But I share, um, this is not just, and, and I know people say all kind of stuff to y'all. And so the name of my company is Beachwood Residential after the neighborhood my family grew up in. It was a minority community that, had, like I said, it was a range of incomes. I'm committed to quality housing for low income families. And, and I'm, not saying, I'm not saying pretty, right? I want it to be pretty, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be anything I wouldn't live in that I wouldn't put my um, family in. I think, like I said, the, the picture shows it has um, smart thermostats, it had faux beams, it has granite countertops. Um, so I, my, the developments that I've done have won national awards. Um, so I'm committed to, this, to, to high quality housing. That's, that, that's, that's the, the minimum standard. And making sure there's good drainage. Good drainage, Because yes, in a lot of our minority communities, there is no drainage. You know, we're constantly building and no drainage. Mm -hmm. So definitely you want to work with the engineering department with the city of Shreveport on draining mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. We're going to turn to Ms. Jackson and then Mr. Elberson. Hi. What was your name? Wendy Daniels. Wendy Daniels. Um, I applaud what you're doing and, and, and you're making great efforts to make improvements, but I have to piggyback on what Ms. McCullough said because in the area where I know we have some affordable housing where there's flooding issues there's different development is is terrible. I mean, horrible. The people they can't get their lighting fixed, and it's called Concordia Place over in Stony Hill, mm -hmm. and it's just where it's just horrible. They paid like a hundred to five hundred dollars for affordable housing, but it's it's really a nightmare for them, mm -hmm. and they're not getting any help after they've gotten in the contracts. Mm -hmm. So what I 
kind of uh, want to suggest to you or recommend that you do that maybe if y'all can, if it's some kind of way that you can investigate as far as the landscaping, the, the drainage, or what's going on in those communities, because yes, everybody wants a nice home. Everybody wants to be able to afford a nice house. But you don't want to have a disaster once you get in there and can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I really applaud what you're doing, but just please, if you could, just make an effort to try to be in their shoes once they put their money in and they're in there. One thing I will say, when I, when I said the, our mission statement, the first thing is enriching the lives of residents. What I didn't talk about is, we have a robust resident services. We don't just move people in and, and forget about them. 30% of these units are set aside for single family households. We have all kind of, in term, of course it's not done yet, but we partner with local um, community organizations to provide financial literacy. Um, you know how they have the grandfather, not grandfather, grandparent mentoring program with the children in the community. We, we don't just develop housing and walk away from the families that live there. It, our goal is to continue to enrich their lives, home buyer seminars, if that's what their goals are. So I, I, I hear you, yeah, yeah. Um, and I and, and I, they were told that same thing. Yeah. Honestly, I'm telling you, but I'm just you know, I, we yeah. just want somebody to just stand on what they're saying because it's a gated area. They're nice homes, mm -hmm. but it's a disaster for the people that are actually standing. Okay, Mr. Elberson. <laughs> Hi, I'm just curious uh, with the type of financing that, that you're going to utilize on this, um, do you all have any requirements for any kind of mixed use uh, on the site? Just No mixed use. We will have a community building, fitness center, um, I think computer lab. I'd have to pull up the exact amenities, but no, no actual commercial space. But everything that would, all your intended uses would fall under the requested zoning, I guess. Yes. Okay. Mr. Mr. Roberts, I have a question. And this is kind of like a twofold question, and I applaud what you're doing, but I understand what my colleagues are saying. Uh, and this is a question for Mr. Clark also. These projects come in front of us first for us to approve them. And then they, and if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and then they have to go in front of the engineer and all that kind of stuff. And some of those questions that we want to know about, like the drainage and all that kind of stuff, that's taken care of in that area. What type of wood you're using and all that kind of stuff. Does it come back to us again? No. Like I said, uh, today, what's before you, and you've gotten all around what's actually the application was submitted for. What's before you is a rezoning of this property from R15, single family residence, to R3, multi family residence. Uh, if the zoning is approved, there is a further process that uh, Beachwood would have to go through. Uh, they would have to submit. Uh, plans for the type of structures they would build. They would have to get those plans uh, approved by the permitting system of the city of Shreveport. There is a city engineer that actually approves the subdivision that would actually review the drainage of the property. Uh, there are a lot of things that happened uh, years and years ago that the uh, Unified Development Code was set out to to correct. Uh, so, you know, I cannot sit here in front of you, and neither can Ms. Daniels, and say that something may not slip through the cracks. But there is a process to where everything will be inspected uh, uh, from the building, but that's not before the MPC board. <coughs> All that's before you is whether or not it is appropriate to rezone this property from single family dwellings to multifamily dwellings. And we will take care of the, and the city of Shreveport will take care of the actual development. And, and, and I guess from my standpoint is, and I understand that, uh, but we are, not, we are proving for the rezoning, but it's gonna always come back to us because it's gonna always be the MPC is doing it. So I guess moving forward, I guess we need to follow the steps and what's going on with these different projects because my colleagues they have a lot of concerns because they've dealt with it in the past so if we can as MPC uh, commissioners and just talk amongst each other and amongst other commissioners city councils and the engineers to make sure follow these projects through to make sure that we're getting quality projects because I love what you're getting ready to do over there because there's a lot of blight over there and that's one thing in, in, in the city of Shreveport we're trying to get rid of so I applaud you on that but in saying that, we do need to make sure that everything, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. 
in that, in that as well. And, and I think, Mr. Moss, it, it's something that we've been thinking about uh, is taking the board on a tour. Uh, I think contrary to what's believed, all the developments that are considered affordable housing are not, I think it was referred to as crappy developments. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, there are some nice developments that are being developed in the city of Shreveport. And I think it's important that the uh, MPC board actually see uh, some of the, uh, the, the exceptional developments that are occurring around the city. Uh, and we're going to try to facilitate such a tour for you so when these type applications come before you, you are more aware of what's out there than what you've heard about of what happened 20 or 30 years ago. And again, um, I think Mr. Clark mentioned I was sensitive to the density um, concern and was open to us lowering the density down from the R3 request to R2. Um, and additionally, I, I was okay with um, stipulations to the zoning that said we had to have additional community meetings, you know, if you want to number how many at what milestones. And also, I'm happy to come back to the um, MPC with periodic um, updates as the project moves forward. And I share it with Ms. Daniels that uh, although it is not a requirement that we would ask her to do additional neighborhood meetings uh, to share with the neighborhood exactly what's being proposed, how it will be laid out, uh, and, and so forth, and she's agreed to return as often as we asked her to return. Mr. Clark, tell me about the, uh, the R3 versus R2 issue. And I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> it's, uh, it deals with, I think in the R3, and they're pulling it up, it deals with uh, that in the R3 you can have quasi high rise uh, development. In the R2, it's, it's just medium and low rise, and that means you can't have you know, five or six story buildings in the R2. And that was one of the concerns that we had was that we would get into the traditional high rise type uh, uh, apartment uh, complexes. But uh, I think Emily has pulled it up and she can share with you exactly what it's saying. Uh, so Mr. Clark is correct that the R2 district would not allow, it would only be low rise, it would not allow for mid rise, which is what would be allowed in R3, but we're looking at there's height requirements as well. Ms. Daniels, is R2 uh, an acceptable alternative? Yes. That's affirmative? Yes. Okay. We Any other questions? With her. I'm sorry, Mr. Clark. No, I'm just sharing with you, we, the planner that's not here right now, you, you listened to her earlier, had had those discussions about R2 versus R3, and that had already been agreed upon. So the height restrictions are the same for both, but it's just the density that would be different. So lower density in the R2 district versus R3. R2 would allow two-story buildings? I believe it would. Let me go back. It's, it's, it's 40 feet is the maximum height for multifamily. <coughs> yeah, we're okay with the R2. Any other questions from Ms. Daniels? Anyone here uh, in support of this project who'd like to speak now? Now's the time to hear from the opponents. Do we have anyone in opposition? Uh, we uh, would like to uh, say uh, if there is a, a, a primary speaker from the neighborhood, that person gets 10 minutes, and everybody who follows gets three. So I don't know if y'all are organized or not, but uh, that's the option. Mr. Robinson, could, Mr. Robinson, could we ask the people that are in opposition to stand so that we could get an idea of how many people, yeah, many people are here in opposition? Yeah. Uh, Ms. McCullough would like all the opponents to stand up, please. Hold on, ma'am. Hold on, ma'am. You can't speak from the floor like that. I'm sorry. If you'd like to speak, we'd welcome you to come up to the microphone. Okay, that's good. Is there a, a, a spokesman for the group or uh, everybody wants to talk? Either way, it's okay with us. 
I think we counted 20, Ms. McCullough. Mm -hmm. 20? Yes, ma'am. Okay, who's number one? Who's going to lead us off? We'd like to hear your name and address, please. My name is Earl Lynch. My address is 2735 Mill Street, and the zip code is 71103-2305. I'm opposed to the multi-family dwelling in the area. That piece of property that they purchased was a designated piece of property for a single purpose, a special purpose. That was a, a Notre Dame school is on that piece of property. There's only three blocks of Mill Street, uh, 27, 28, you skip 29, because that whole section was dedicated to the school, so there are no uh, city facilities there, you know, water and Swepco would have to go in and everything. But uh, we are opposed to this. Uh, in Lakeside, you won't find uh, that kind of housing. I agree with Ms. McCulloch. If you drive through the neighborhood, you will see a lot of vacant lots there. And uh, we support redevelopment. Instead of coming in and doing something with this set-aside property, uh, we like for it to stay true to the original deed. Many years ago, I asked an assessor, how do you determine what can be done with a piece of property? She told me, you be true to the original deed. What was it intended for? And this was intended for a school. Many years ago, when our country was being developed, uh, many people were coming and they couldn't read, write, or uh, cipher numbers, as they would call it. So they would put X's on their documents, and they would file these documents in the courthouses. So somebody looked at all of this, these X's and said, we need to do something with education. So in Kalamazoo, Michigan, they decided to tax the population, and, have, and that was the beginning of public school. So that system, uh, it, it went on to develop across our country Land was set aside for educational purposes, for the purchasing of building schools, uh, for it, make sure everybody uh, had a building or uh, some place where they could put educational facilities. Well, that didn't include everybody. So along came Mr. Paul O'Brien, that's the man that built the school and purchased the property, and it was that's what it was designated for. I was elated when the people was from Baton Rouge were coming to Shreveport and pass all this real estate up on their way up to come up here to do bit, redevelop our area. Uh, that's a plus. But on the other side, this is the wrong area for what you want to do. Uh, you need to put that in another section of town. Uh, I looked at Oak Forest up on the Cooper Road when it was developed. Uh, I look at the condition of that subdivision now. I look at Hollywood, uh, Hollywood Heights. I look at the structure of those houses now. You got a few houses when you first go into the neighborhood, but after that, everything goes to similar. You can't tell one house from the other. So we're opposed to that. And multifamily uh, dwellings, I go to Queensburg. And I think, I look, I was looking Miss Betsy Smith used to talk about the flowers and trees and things. And I'm looking for something beautiful. The people weren't painting the houses. They weren't planting flowers or nothing. So they depressed. This affects their emotions. That has an effect on people. So we want something nice. And we're in a stage of our life now where people in the military, I said last meeting, they're coming back. Uh, people are retiring from their jobs, they moving back, and they don't want to move back to no apartment. They want to come back to a home. We uh, are involved in building a neighborhood, building a community. That's what we like to see in our area, uh, redevelopment of our neighborhood. 
Um, Mr. Lynch? We've come a long ways. Hmm? I, I didn't want to interrupt you, Mr. Lynch, but you're pushing up, up against your time limit. Let me ask you a question. Notre Dame opened in 1958. When did it close? Uh, in um, coming into the uh, 70s, first part of the 70s. And, and do you know why? No, 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 the city limits was right there where Evergreen is, Baptist Church on Allen Avenue. It was just a little east of that. Then in, when I was in high school, the city limits moved to Madison Avenue, which is just on the other side of Booger T. That's, they didn't, wasn't no bus, it was a trolley. That's where the trolley would turn around and go back. So everything beyond that point was outside the city. Then later on, they moved the city limits up to where the waterworks are on the Blanchard Road. And uh, from there, they moved on out to uh, Greenwood, uh, Greenwood Road, out there just about right in that area where McDonald's is located. So I've had a chance to see the city grow and uh, people in education along with it. And my father was one of those that valued education. Uh, it's the lifeblood of our community. Mr. Lynch, what's your street? Metal, M E T A L. It's off of her. Metal Street. Mm hmm. Is Mr. Temple cutting the grass there at uh, Notre Dame? Say what? The current owner is Collis Temple from Baton Rouge. Is he cutting the grass since he bought the property? I haven't seen it being cut. Well, um, there's a bunch of other folks who want to talk. Okay. Thank you for your remarks. Oh, one other thing I'd like to say across the street, from this property, there's a church called St. Augustine. I'm pretty sure the members of that church don't want music while they're trying to have worship service. I'm pretty sure they don't want to hear the lawn mows and the blowers going while they're trying to have service. Is the pastor here? Yeah. Did you stand? Oh, he went out a minute. That's one of the members there. I think St. Augustine is over 100 years old. Any questions for Mr. Lynch? Well, I I just got a question. What would you like to see happen in that in that area? I would like to see the redevelopment of those vacant lots. Um, I'm not talking about the vacant lots. I'm talking about the school because the, the school, school is, is blight. Yeah, it's it's Nobody's, like it's yeah. like neckties and dresses and suits. Uh, give it time and it'll come back around again. Well, it's been sitting it'll there come for a while. back, yeah. and uh, with a little push and a shove, everything goes around. Like they say, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, we're going through some difficult times now with the COVID and other things around the world, but it's going to come back. Now, the Mr. people are going to come back. Now, Mr. Lynch, and we're going to see person. Shreveport strong. Yeah. And Shreveport got to be strong. I see you love your community. Uh, you love your community and you're strong, <laughs> but you're going to have to get around there and push some more of those people <laughs> to get that taken care of over there. Thank because you. Because that, that school has been sitting there since it closed and people are living in there. They have a lot of people staying over there in place. If you go over there and visit it, because I drive through there quite often to look at that school, because it's a historical mon uh, monument, uh, really, and they need to be taken care of better. Yeah, so all the people in the community around there, you know, I'm not telling you what to do, but you're saying you're strong. If that's your neighborhood, y'all come up with a plan and, and talk to the young lady and tell her what you want to see over there. That's why she's going to have those open meetings if this happens. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, the, 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 it's, the field is open. They're, they're open for suggestions. But to say not to do nothing with that school is just something needs to take place in that area to bring mm -hmm. back some life over there in that area. It would be nice. Okay. Thank right. you, Mr. Lynch. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Uh, anyone else want to speak? Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Name and address, please. My name is Marilyn Bartlett, 2827 Ashton Street. And I'm opposed. Part of the opposition is because, um, like Mr. Lynch stated, rental property, we have some people there that are renters now. And 
unfortunately, renters don't always value the property. So what we are seeing now is a decline in keeping up the property, a pride, having, the, having pride in the neighborhood, just driving on the next street. The looks has changed. So listening to the developer say that a building, new rent, a mixed housing rental, that's still the key word. It's a rental. You're not providing an opportunity for them to be vested in the community. If you don't, if you are not vested, then you destroy, you leave it. And that's what's happening. It's being destroyed. So building a building does not equate to uplifting a neighborhood. So unless there's a better plan to allow people an ownership, then you're adding to what's already there that we need to get rid of. The neighborhood meetings. We received a letter after this first meeting. So it was fortunate that it was rescheduled because we wouldn't have been able to be here because the announcement came after the fact. The rezoning signs had already been put up. So conversations had already been taking place. What I would like to know is when will you come back and ask the community, what do we need? What do you want to see? Nothing should happen in this community without our support. Thank you. Any questions for, is it Miss Margaret? Bartlett. Bartlett, Miss Bartlett. Any questions for Miss Bartlett? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yuri Coleman. My address is 3111 Looney Street. Ms. Coleman, can you speak up, please? Put that mask down a little bit. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. My name is Yuri Coleman. Uh, my address is 3111 Looney Street. And I, too, am opposed to this. But I do have a question or two. Ms. Gwen, I don't remember your last name, so just let me address you as that. When you um, talk about that property now, you go back and forth. Now, when you're done with this deal, you're done you're back to bad mood. Ms. Coleman, right. can you address you us, please? Uh, we're going to ask Ms. Daniel to come back a little bit later. Okay. So you address, you. address your questions to us. Okay. Well, in that case, that takes care of three of my questions. Well, do you know then if this project is, do is done, whether or not it will be, who's going to manage this property? Will it be managed by the Housing Authority of Shreveport? Will it be managed by the City of Shreveport? Who exactly is going to have control of the management of this facility that's in our neighborhood Mr. that it's on um, we'll, we'll address that with miss daniel when she comes back up okay you will address that with miss daniel also i did i could barely hear the comments on the r2 and the r3 so i'm a little bit confused on that the residential two and the three um some of the buildings that she did show was a two-story building. She said that would only be centered in the middle or certain sector, but does that not put it into a different category, the R2 and the R3? I'm a little bit confused on that. So will I have housing that's two stories above or one story above my house that looks down on me? So I am concerned about the structure as well, okay? So I guess that's something that you were asking her as well. The other thing is she talked about the mixed income uh, 5% that would be restricted for $20,000 or below, 45%, 33 below, and the 30% that she mentioned was 40 
below that takes care of 85 percent what happens with the other percentage and what below does that below when you say 40,000 and below that can also mean below 20 that That's could it. mean 15 That's a good okay point. that could mean 10 or 5 because each number goes below mm -hmm. so we need to be a little bit more specific on that okay and um, also the mixed income housing by um, 50,000 below. So I did have a question and I'll allow you all to take that to her and I'm almost running out of time. But for the most part, if we're talking about this type of housing and even with the $50,000 um, income and the $10,000, $20,000 income, I'm not prejudiced against anybody because I've been in both brackets, you know. I've lived in good neighborhoods and I've lived in bad. I made a decision to come back to my neighborhood because I made a decision is where I wanted to live in my parents' home and I am so happy there. So, um, but I am concerned if it were I, um, if I made 50, 60, $70,000 a year, I certainly am not going to choose to live in an area that is already considered maybe not a uh, bad area, but am I going to choose those areas? So when those persons don't choose those areas, what do you do with those remaining units that you have that have not been filled in by the 50,000, 40,000, 30,000? Do you leave them empty or do you make the exception and say, okay, well, we have to rent them to someone because it is about making the money. That was one of the things you know, that was brought into play. So that's my other concern. That's the reality of that, okay? My third thing is the zoning that you're talking uh, about. I'm, a, I'm opposed to the zoning period because when you talk about um, zoning from one to the other, then you open the opportunities for other build for other uh, businesses and for other persons uh, to come in and say, we want to build some let houses Let me make a motion to, to extend the time. Can we do that? I'm, I'm almost finished. Just give me one more minute. Okay, because there are, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Right. There are a lot of empty lots there. There are a lot of unmaintained properties, which means when you rezone this area, then Billy Joe Willie and Mary Sue Pookie can come in and say, okay, I'm just going to take these two lots and I can put something on here and there because it has been zoned for that. And that won't have to even be cleared through this our planning committee because the door has already been opened for that. So I would like you all to reconsider zoning, period. And by the way, I am a 1975 graduate of Notre Dame High School. Okay. <laughs> Any questions from Ms. Coleman? <coughs> Any questions from Ms. Coleman? Okay, who's next? Hi, my name is Lois Davis. I live at 3114 Metal Street. Bring that microphone down, please, and let, let us have your name and address again. My name is Lois, L-O-I-S, Davis. I live at 3114 Metal Street. I was raised in that neighborhood from age four to 17. I'm now 75. I left Shreveport and came back in 2012 to take care of my mom and Although she died last year, I'm still here. Uh, I attended school in that area. I went to Central Free Methodist, graduated from Notre Dame in 1965. And uh, I thought about that area when the young lady was talking about the area she grew up in. Because when I grew up on Metal Street, it was very similar to her neighborhood. Everybody lived in that neighborhood. My mom was a beautician. We had doctors, we had lawyers, we had all kinds of mixed groups of people. And most of them were, in fact, homeowners. I've looked at that area now, and it's blighted. It's blighted. I'm very concerned about some of the things that the people talk about, about renters coming in with different values, but that's not necessarily so. I'm also concerned about people who say people won't come to that area if this is built because they want to be homeowners. Let's look at the economy. There aren't going to be a lot of homeowners if the prices stay what they are. I'm excited about the young lady's proposal. I think details need to be worked out. I think that it would be great if people could get some of the things that they want in that neighborhood. But I'm excited about the fact that somebody wants to come and help bring that neighborhood up. 
I think the proposal is excellent. I think it's well thought out. I think you do have to look at drainage. You do have to look at uh, what kind of materials they're going to use. But I think it's a tremendous opportunity to help that neighborhood come back. And so although I was uncertain as to what my position would be when I came, after listening to her, despite what some of the neighbors say, I'm in favor of it. I am not in favor of the fact that apparently some of the people did not get the notice that I got, so that some of the people have not been informed. So that aspect of the project, of the process, uh, I don't agree with. But otherwise, I'm excited, so thank you. Ms. Daniels, did you receive Ms. Daniels? I'm sorry, Ms. Davis. Thank yes. You. Ms. Davis, I'm sorry. Yes. Did you receive a uh, invitation to a neighborhood participation meeting? I don't remember getting that. I got the, the letter from this commission, the first letter and the second letter. I did not get, I do not remember getting the neighborhood participation. Uh, Any questions from Ms. Davis? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Who's next? Ms. Daniels, you taking notes? My name is Sharon Brim. I live at 2900 Ashton Street, which is right across the street from the lot that you all are talking about. And I am in total disagreement with you all putting a multifamily rezoning there because I am the one that lives across the street the other people that you live to live down the street around the corner. I would prefer it to stay a single family uh, zoning. And then if you want to, like you all have said that you all were talking about doing a single family, but it was better money for you all to do the multifamily. So I think that we still need to go back and to look at our community as a whole. Yes, it is going down because a lot of people came in and bought up the houses, but they don't keep them up. So we already have enough slum lords or whatever uh, people who rent houses out in our neighborhood. We need someone to come in who wants to bring up the neighborhood. I do not want to walk out my door or on the side of my yard and see a multifamily unit across the street from my property. I am a homeowner in Lakeside. So it means a lot to me. My family has been there since it was a Lakeside when they first started building over there. So my family has invested in the community since Lakeside started, and I wanna to continue to invest in community. I'm fussing with property standards. I'm doing everything I need in my community, but we don't want you to come in with some pretty little houses, some duplexes, some apartments. Come in and give the people the opportunity to become homeowners. What happened to Shreveport with the 235, the 225 projects from years ago that would help people become homeowners? Renters, you can have apartment complex on the outskirts of Lakeside. I'm all for that. I'm not smack in the middle of our community. But once again, I am at 2900 Ashton Street, and it's right across the street from me. Any questions from Ms. Grimm? Oh, I'm sorry. It's Grimm, correct? Brim, B as in Brim. boy, R I M. Brim. Brim, thank you, ma'am. Any other uh, uh, people in opposition? Good afternoon. My name is Shanita Woodson Jones. I represent my aunt and uncle. They are now deceased. Helen Jameson died this past April. My uncle, um, her husband, Levi Jameson. I have spent the last five years there at their house. Mr. Levi Jameson died back in 2008, but they have been homeowners there, I think since the 1950s. I'm trying to go through materials to find out the exact years, but they have been there, and I think they called that whole subdivision Breezy Hills because we just paid property taxes for the end of the year for her. However, to piggyback on what um, 
Mrs. Davis just said and Ms. Bartlett said, they got letters about the Metropolitan Planning Commission doing this activity and beginning this. We received no information at 2737 Ashton, nor did my neighbor, Miss Essie Jones, and her husband, Mr. Michael Jones, and they have been there a long time. I found out today, listening to KTBS news this morning, that this was going on today. So I started sending out text messages for people to try to show up today and oppose it. I am opposing it because we don't know anything about it. Now, I listened today to the young lady, Miss Wendy Daniels, and it sounds good, but just like, um, I'm about to say Sister Wilson McCulloch, Rose Wilson McCulloch and um, Rachel Jackson, the members of the Metropolitan Planning Commission, I agree. The quality has to be there. You just don't want to build something that looks good and then a year later it's not effective and it's not going to last and it's not going to be something that brings pride to the community. I attended Notre Dame. I graduated in 1979. I attended Central Free Methodist for daycare and kindergarten. So I have a vested interest. I grew up in Lakeside and, and um, School Park subdivision. I am a physician. I had to retire in um, 2013 due to an illness. I developed multiple sclerosis. So I have a vested interest in the community. Please don't let these, uh, um, this mixed income community come up or be developed without community input. We are starting off with poor communication. Not all of the streets haven't been involved. All of the neighbors don't know. So everyone, I'm not really sure how the people who got the letters were selected to receive letters. There weren't any signs. I think um, Ms. Bartlett said there was a zoning sign. I haven't seen it. I always exit out on her. Was it out there? Okay, so I don't drive back up in the neighborhood to exit the neighborhood to know that there is a meeting about the, uh, the school. So if you could put the information, the signs that have to be put up, if they could be put up along the perimeter, down Hearn, up Milan, and down that last street that goes back into the neighborhood and back out, and then up and down the streets, because everyone doesn't exit the same way. We have to all be informed and on the same page, and we need to have a neighborhood meetings with you all or with the developer to know whether we truly support it or we don't. Ms. Jones? Yes. Uh, your address, please. My address is 179 Palladium, P-A-L-L-A-D-I-U-M Lane, L-A-N-E, Shreveport, Louisiana, 71115. And Ms. Jones, um, for your information, mm -hmm. the signs go up on the property in question. Okay. So lining the neighborhood with signs would not be appropriate. Okay. Um, the notice goes to property owners, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Clark, within a 500 foot radius of the property. So that's generally a illustration of where those notices should have gone. Well, now, I'm our, not really sure system, what 500 Our system is not perfect. But yes, we're sir. trying to make it better. Yeah. Thank you so much for progress, not perfection. I'm not asking for that. There you go. I'm just praying that we can all be on one accord because we don't want a disaster being put up there on that property. Ms. Jones, you said you attended Notre Dame? I did. I graduated valedictorian in 1979. Right. 1979. <laughs> got a question. There you go. I got a question. I well, went well, to Our Lady of the Blessed Sacrament, too. Well, Ms. Jones, yes. uh, um, when did the school close? In the, you look, with the multiple sclerosis, I, I was thinking, because I attended several of those meetings. I think it did in the Shreveport Sun, they finally closed it in the 2000s. 
mid 2000s maybe because I was working when it closed but they um remember it was a school that they transferred everybody from Our Lady of the Blessed Sacrament to that school and then they would feed into Loyola I think it was um, towards the end of it but it closed um, maybe before 2005 or what, around what, 2005 why did the school close financially why, why? it wasn't sustained you know people weren't contributing and people weren't sending their kids to go to school there well, you know because I graduated um, in a class of 21 there were small class sizes and the tuition was not it accommodated the neighborhood it wasn't like tuition is now you know fifteen hundred dollars no it was not like that any questions from Ms. Jones uh, I just got one Mr. She can, I don't know if she can answer do y'all have a neighborhood association in that no, area? no look that's not my neighborhood but I'll tell you since I've been there with my aunt I go I look I've always been finding out different things about people but I can't answer that let me just sh okay. look okay. close All my right. mouth do Thank we have a neighborhood association no. Okay. See, I can't speak for this. Okay. That's, that's, that's okay. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Right. Thank you so much. Who's next? Name and address, please. Good evening. Alexandria Bartlett, 2827 Ashton Street. I grew up in Lakeside, and Lakeside was a community where you had single family homes with children. I have a child of my own now and I don't even feel comfortable with him going outside because the dynamics of the neighborhood has changed. Yes, it is a good idea to develop something new in the community, but not a rental property. You have many children there who do not have a place to go after school. Something needs to be productive for them. What they're seeing in that neighborhood are drugs, sometimes prostitution, and this is because of certain rental properties. I've had to call the police on certain issues on just our street because of drugs. I have got in touch with, tried to get in touch with our councilman about the um, property standards of lots. Nothing has been accomplished. Even with the Blessed Sacrament property it's all grown up the the fence is down most of the people that were homeowners in that at, in that neighborhood have passed on those properties have been given to their family members or they have been sold to people who don't even live in that neighborhood that neighborhood has a rich history and now it is embarrassing to see outsiders come in from different areas that have no intentions of making it better. If you want to make it better, you need to involve the community. You asked about the neighborhood association. We used to have a neighborhood association, but I believe that person that was over it passed. Um, yes, we do need new development, but not rental properties. Teach these communities, especially our young people, how to maintain ownership or home ownership, not being renters the rest of their lives. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Bartlett? Thank you, ma'am. My name is Doris Mosley. Um, I'm known as Gina. I was born and raised in Lakeside. Address, please. Uh, my address, my current address is 5643 Tall Pines Way, and that's in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I'm a product of the area that you all are trying to develop the housing there. I don't live in the community, but I am still ever present in that community because I still own the properties that my mother and my grandmother 
left those properties to us, which is 1320 Arkansas, 1324 Arkansas, 2939 Murphy, 2853 Harp Street, and, and there are others. And so I have a, a, a huge interest in that community. When you speak of blight, yes, there's blight, but it's not just vacant lots. Take a ride through there and you will see houses. You see houses that people are still living in in disrepair. You see houses that's been abandoned and it's boarded up. And you see houses that need severe attention to. So when I moved away, I just recently returned here after 51 years. I just recently moved back in 2021. I tried years ago to get into the program where they were talking about revitalizing declining communities. When I called, because in the real estate books, they give you addresses and telephone numbers where you can call to get grant money, individual citizens, residents in Louisiana, where you can get grant money to revitalize a community. However, I was told that monies are distributed. Well, actually, I was told that there's no more money left. So this is the beginning of the fiscal year. How is it that, my question, how is it that money is not there when this is starting where the money should be there? So I was told that is, is I actually housed and manned by politicians. OK, so that didn't happen. So I checked into the property myself to buy it on my own. Uh, at the time, it was being sold for like $300,000. I don't know what it is now because I didn't live here at the time, but that's what I was checking into to do it on my own which is what I would love to see. It's not that I'm so opposed, I am opposed to this project right now, but it's not like I'm so opposed to something new coming into the community. What I do oppose is you got a brand new structure coming into the community, but you've got all of these residents, like uh, some of the uh, residents have said they, a lot of them, my mother, grandmother who was there, I was born and raised there, um, they, they are not there anymore. So it's just a lot of rental. So the rentals are not being kept up. I keep my properties up because I don't want it to be like the blight that everybody is speaking of. So how do you feel that residents would <coughs> like to have a brand new structure put there and then you've got houses across the street, wooded woods and, and just total destruction all around this beautiful, so to speak, development that's going to be there. I say that the, uh, that whole process of revitalizing a community, let some of the residents that live there, I, the first meeting that was canceled, I was here and I got a chance to speak to one of the residents. And the resident said she tried to get some help. She tried to get help to fix up her property, but she can't. So we're taxpayers, so let us use our taxpayers to do something with the blighted houses before we bring in something right smack dab in the middle of something that you've got total dis devastation and destruction all the way around that community. Any Thank questions you. for Ms. Mobley? Oh, sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Gregory Smith, I pastor uh, St. Augustine Baptist Church that is located directly uh, in front of Notre Dame itself. And uh, I stand today, and I think this will help all of us and probably saw uh, some of the uh, contention that might be settled in this place. I think if we could have, because I know uh, Brother Clark said that on last evening when we spoke in this matter last month, that letters were sent out, and I think he told us that only two people showed up. But today we can sense and see 
there's more than two people. So I think that if we could come to some type of agreement where we can set up a meeting between the community and the developer, we can, I think we can kill a whole lot of time that we're going here now. Right. Because most people that are coming to the podium won't answer that you all cannot give. But I think if we could sit down with the young lady and she can lay out her intentions and these that have concerns about their development, I think we might be able to come to a reasonable understanding and then go forward from that. That's my position. Pastor, what is your address? Uh, my physical address? Mm -hmm. Your home address? 4518 Benton Road. 4518 Benton Road, uh -huh. Bossier City? Uh-huh. And it's Griffin Smith, correct? Gregory. Gregory, 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 Gregory I'm sorry. Uh -huh. St. Augustine Baptist Church? Directly, uh, directly across the street uh, from the proposed property. Uh -huh. We're going to raise that issue with Ms. Daniels. I think it would, it would I don't think, I really believe that it would really uh, give some, some directions to the people that have great concerns, whether they're in opposition or they're supported. At least now you see that the community We'll come and meet with her, sit with her, and talk with her, and she can lay out some things, and they can ask her some questions directly, and she can directly answer them instead of coming to the podium asking you guys for information that you can't answer because she has the answer that we need. So if it's possible that that can be scheduled, and I want to thank uh, uh, Councilwoman Taylor uh, for really uh, being a backbone in helping because I had no idea and I only been the pastor there for about two and a half months, not two and a half months, something like that. But uh, I was informed, and uh, I want to be a five. I want our church to be a fiber of the community, where we're just not going to sit down on our do nothings. But we want to be a fiber of the community to do whatever it takes. Uh, now let me say this: I take my seat. Uh, we we are not responsible for a home that has trash, grass need to be cut, and a hole in the wall. Those people in that home have to be responsible to have some love and care for the community to try to keep it clean. But when it comes to the development that's coming to our community, we, I would just like to sit down with her personally along with other uh, uh, people of the community and just let her talk to us as individuals and we get a chance to hear her. She get a chance to answer questions directly from us and then we'll have a better understanding uh, about the proposal itself. Can That's you, my conviction. Can you host that meeting? I'd be glad to host it. Do you think it's possible, Pastor, that a development as described by Ms. Daniels could lift up the entire neighborhood? It's a po I'm not going to say that it's not. It's a possibility that it can. But at the same time, I want others to voice their opinion without me just being the fact that they say that it can. I'm not, I'm not here to kick it. I'm not here to tear down. I'm not here in the opposition. I'm here because I don't know all the information. Yeah. And so with, that, with a lack of information, I can't make the right judgment. I understand. So that's my, that's my conviction. Any questions for uh, Pastor Smith? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. I'm going to be brief. Um, my name is Shalana Moore. My address is 121 AW Drive in Stonewall. I do own a property on Ashton Street in the neighborhood that is affected. And I just want to say, I didn't get to go to Notre Dame. It closed before I was able. But my, all of my siblings did attend and graduated. Uh, two sisters and uh, my brother graduated from Southwood but had attended Notre Dame. I did attend Blessed Sacrament. And I, I don't have a problem with uh, revitalization. I also would like preservation. That community has produced uh, so many different uh, professionals 
My eldest sister is an engineer. My middle sister is uh, a retired educator. I'm an educator, a professional educator. I lived on Ashton Street as a teacher in Kettle Parish, and I had two children that I was raising at the time. One of my children has graduated from Tulane and is in law school at NYU. My other son is a student at Wiley College. And I say that to say, for me, this community is about raising our children and protecting them and keeping them safe. And so I have that personal experience as a parent and as an educator to know that that community requires levels of safety for the children that live there. We want our children to be able to go outside and play and not be concerned about their safety, okay? Um, that's where I'm coming from in regards to developing our neighborhood. We have some pieces in that neighborhood that need preservation. Notre Dame is one of them. Central Free Methodist is one of them. They have rich history for our community and for our city. And that's all. It's Moore, correct? Yes. Any questions for Ms. Moore? No. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon. My name is Jeremiah Coleman. My address is 3111 Looney Street. And before I go any further, I want to make it perfectly clear that I did not go to Notre Dame. <laughs> I did not grow up in Lakeside. But I'm an implant. And I have many observations. I applaud the company, can't remember your name. Miss Daniels. Miss Daniels, I applaud your company and I applaud what you are doing and your abilities to construct and, and do projects. But I have some concerns that even an oasis in the middle of a desert is just one spot. But all around the oasis is still land and nothing else. To build a beautiful facility there in that location would be wonderful. But all around that location, that oasis, it's barren, it's a desert. To build that project or that facility there is fine, but who will partner with that organization who's building that oasis? Partner with them and, and, and work with them with the infrastructure, work with them with all of the other properties around. I, I know this meeting is about rezoning, but this is a question to this board, to all that is concerned and all that is involved, uh, just to rezone and if we approve the rezoning, they build this beautiful facility. And all around, we still have these vacant lots and these substandard housing and and these slumlords who are not doing anything for their properties. I question what the future holds for that location, what the future holds for that facility that you're going to build there that you're not going to be able to put people that's making $50,000 in there. 
You might get them in there when it's brand new. But after a year or so with the infrastructure that's in that area, the streets, the, the, the shanties and the torn down housing, and you're gonna end up, we're gonna have a big major project in the middle of Lakeside, a historic location. That's all I have to say. I applaud you for what you're doing. I applaud your abilities, but I think we need to look a little further at what we're gonna do, look at the future, not just at the present. Thank you for your time. Any questions from Mr. Coleman? Mm, I just got comments, comments. Not for them, just, just comments. So can we do that? Thank Please you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. I believe we're getting the picture. Is there anybody else? Oh, it's time for the board to deliberate. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Daniels, it's time for you to, uh, to re uh, respond to your critics. And uh, uh, can you do it maybe in 10 minutes? I know there's oh, a lot of ground not, to cover here. Not, I'm not going to take that long. Um, I think that there's clear that, um, I think as the pastor said, that a lot of people have a lot of questions. I don't know that it's beneficial for me to go through all, every single question I heard. I feel like we need to have an opportunity to sit down as a community with myself. What I would ask is, um, I know that the this moves from this process to the council, and if I have an opportunity to meet with the community, I, I would like you all to move forward with the vote today, simply because of timing. Um, I think the initial t um, meeting we were supposed to have was rescheduled for some reason, and then when I was supposed to come last month, it was a tornado, so I didn't come. And so I'm worried about continuing to defer this in the timeline with the application we want to submit for financing. But what I would like to have is an opportunity to sit down with the community and have an in-depth conversation. If they have, you know, I'm, I'm prepared to have a list and get a, a sign-in sheet. I know they don't have a, a neighborhood group, so I don't, you know, if the pastor could assist and the city council person can assist in getting the information out so we can have a meeting that's well attended, I'd like to sit down before it goes to council and have an in-depth conversation and be able to answer these questions. Um, with the community. If y'all have some specific things you would like me to address, I'm happy to do that. I did take notes on questions that people have, but that, that's essentially my request. And in addition to that, I will say, again, as a condition of the zoning, I don't want to just have one conversation with the community. I, I'm prepared to continue to have ongoing conversations as we move forward with the design process. When we are ready to sit down with the architects and, and, and look at different buildings, somebody said we don't want to have it where you can't tell one house from the other. Those are things that we can have the community's input on, what the actual structures look like. Um, and, I, and the only other thing I will say is, and I, and I know this is a hard conversation. I understand that. I've, I've done this, like I said, for 20 years. I know this is a hard conversation. Um, part of what you find, though, is an individual that's making, let's say, $19,000 a year, where are they supposed to rent housing? Oftentimes, these blighted properties that y'all see is the only property that that family can afford to live in because the slumlords are only charging maybe $500 or $300 a month, so they're living there. But that doesn't mean that the quality of the tenant is always the problem. Sometimes it's literally the quality of the housing. And so I think this, again, is you know a $17 million investment in this community that, that could be the seed that needs to be planted so additional people will come in and redevelop some of the single family lots and homeowners are willing to move into the community but part of the question we have to ask ourselves is you know a pharmacy technician that that provides our our medication at Walgreens where does she get to live with her two kids I mean it's a real question and that and part of what we are finding is people are not able to find quality housing they are rent burdened, which means they're struggling to make decisions on housing and food and medication and things like that. So what we are trying to do is address that need. I know it's hard to do that in somebody's community. We want everybody to be happy with the community that we develop. But every community I've ever developed, it's a waiting list to get in there. They, they maintain 100% occupancy, long term. So, so these communities, it proves that there is a, is a dire need for this type of housing. Um, and so. Again, I would love to have an opportunity to sit down with everyone. I really am sensitive to what y'all's concerns are. I really am. So I will, I will welcome the opportunity um, to meet with the community and, and, and try to gain more support. Can I ask a question? I, I 
heard you say this was rental. Uh, what I'm familiar with in dealing with tax credits, um, I remember the term lease to buy. So this is not what you're doing. No. They won't. They the people were leasing to buy. You had to you had to lease for five years before you could even start to buy. Um, there are different. Um, so this and they were tax credits. They have different options in tax credit communities, and sometimes you, it's point driven. It's a competitive process, and so there was a time where you would get additional points if you would commit to having lease to purchase properties. But a lot of times, what they found is many of those units were never actually purchased by the tenants. So, so I, I've never done a development where it was leased to purchase, um, okay. but that the, the community you may be responding to was probably being sensitive to whatever the scoring um, categories mm -hmm. were at that particular so this time. Is not leased it to is buy. not leased to buy. Okay. Uh, Ms. Daniels, who, who will manage the property once it's built? We haven't selected a property management company. I will say it's not the housing authority. The housing authority has nothing to do with this development. So it's, it'll be Beachwood that'll manage We property. don't have a property management company. We hire a third party property management company that will vet um, before. But again, these units won't be established until 2025. So we haven't hired a property management company this early on. And I would assume that they'll be the ones to administer the income issues so it's a very steep compliance regulation i mean like i said they have investors that are um that have an ownership in the deal that main that that require that the compliance is maintained um to preserve their their tax credits there there was a question about the low income mm -hmm. part of the equation what percentage will be low income so it depends on what you call low income. So we have a range. Define it for I, I think, me. say again. Define it for me. Well, I think it's subjective what you consider low income, right? Like if you, so I'm, I'm, I can tell you the different tiers. It's all affordable. It's all um, what we consider affordable housing. Um, she was referencing the percentages, and she I think her, she said when she added it up, it didn't equal um, 100%. So I can share. It's probably on my computer, but I can share that information with her to tell her to break down. I said 5% of the units were restricted for families at 20%. 45% of the units were restricted for families at 33%. I mean, I'm sorry, let me go back. 5% at $20,000, 45% at $33,000, 30% at $40,000, and 20% at $52,000. Go through those numbers again, please. 5%. And this is just me simplifying the conversation. Like, you know, I can give you the I AMIs appreciate and all that. that. We won't hold you so five percent for families at twenty thousand dollars or lower. Forty-five percent for families at thirty-three thousand dollars or lower. Thirty percent at forty thousand dollars, and twenty percent at fifty-two thousand. Twenty thousand or lower. How low do you go? Well, you have to be able to pay the rent, so you have to have income. But the rents for those units are as low as, I think, $151 a month. Can you meet with the neighborhood before we vote? Yes. I mean, if that's what you all will require. Yeah. I, I prefer to have you all vote and then I meet before it goes to council, but if you all won't allow it, then, you know. Mr. Clark, can you speak to that? You're saying tonight, or you're saying to come back? Right now. Oh, okay. No, he's saying no. He's saying defer. You're saying defer. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to defer, but again, it's, it's, I understand. it's your pleasure. We, Mr. Clark? We, we're, we're coming up with those dates. Uh, if you would vote to approve this today, we're thinking that it would be introduced to council on the 24th. And final. And, and, and the final will be the 14th of February. So the, the matter would go to the council on the 24th of January? Oh, January. For introduction? Yes. Right. If you're inclined to. And, fi and final vote when? 14th of February. 14th of February. So for the purposes of the, of, of the audience, the, the commission is not the final stop for Ms. Daniels. <coughs> the rezoning would be subject to city council approval. And it, as Mr. Clark has identified, 
uh, should the this board approve this rezoning today, uh, it would be introduced as an ordinance before the city council on the 24th of January mm -hmm. and held over uh, until the 14th of February for a final vote, unless there's more uh, delays by the council. Yes, it is Mr. going Clark. to the council regardless because this is a rezoning application and the ultimate decision will be made by the Shreveport City Council. Uh, it may be influential, for lack of a better term, your recommendation, but you don't have the, the final decision that rests with the Shreveport City Council. It's going anyway, the 24th and the 14th. And anyone can speak to the council on this matter, can they not? That's, that's left up to the council, but I'm sure that the council will be, they have a section for public okay. comment and someone could make public comment at that time. Understand. Okay. Uh, at this point, I think it's appropriate for the commission to deliberate. I think you're right, sir. Who wants question, to kick off? So my question is, are we in a hurry? Are we in a hurry? Well, <laughs> you're asking me? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're deliberating. Are we in a hurry? Uh, I don't believe we're in a hurry, no. Oh, okay. Mr. Chair, you have to put a motion forward before you guys go into deliberation. So uh, 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 I'm, I've been advised that uh, uh, do we have a motion to approve? Motion to defer. Second. Motion by Mr. Balderas to defer, second by Ms. McCullough. And Mr. Balderas, um, what do you want to happen in this I do delay? Think that, I, do, I do think that both parties need to meet, and we need to have a, the, the, the neighborhood needs to participate in this conversation. Uh, I think the developer needs to listen to what the neighbor, neighborhood wants and they would like to see it being built there. And Ms. McCullough, you seconded that? That's correct. Is there any discussion on the motion by Mr. Balderas? He no. wants to delay this matter until the February meeting? No, I agree with him because there is so much opposition in the, in the audience. And, and it's fair, it's only fair that they know what is going on and it's gonna happen in their community. So it, it gives Ms. Um, Daniels. Daniels an opportunity to present to them what, what her plans are and, you know, and then they can also deliberate with her and let them know what they would like to see in the community. So I agree. I do think that it takes a village to, to build a business. I do think that the, the comments from the neighbor, neighborhoods will be helpful for you. Mr. Sater? I, what does that do to Ms. Daniels deferring in another month? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Daniels, is this going to kill your project? So the financing that we are applying for is due next month, next week. <clears throat> you don't have to have the zoning approved at the time that you submit the financing, but you do have to include a letter saying that you are in the process of having your property rezoned. Um, the the application is is a ten thousand dollar application to submit. I mean, we've spent probably fifty thousand dollars already to date, and so the concern is continuing to spend money if, for whatever reason, this project will not ultimately um, move forward, n get past council and and, and um, I mean the commission and in the council. So that was why my request was if you all could deliberate today and you still give me time. I think if it has to go to council anyway, it gives me time to meet with the community, continue to have the conversations between now and when the council hears it, since it has to go to them anyway, as Mr. Clark said. So it, 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 it you know, it's not ideal, but ultimately, I, I mean, I, it is what it is, depending on what you all decide. Any more comments by board members? We have a motion on the floor to delay this matter. Mr. Elberson? I think there, I'll just back up what uh, Mr. Baldera said. I think there's been some valid points on uh, both sides. Uh, I think there's reason to consider it for multifamily there. I think there's reason to consider 
that it stay single family there. Um, I'm excited about this type of investment being made in this community. I think everybody is. Um, but I think that the community needs to embrace the project. Yes. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, if you get these parties in a room together that there will be a positive outcome for the project. That's just my, my, my thought right now and my hope, honestly. So I, I, I'll have to support the, the motion as well to defer. Mr. Andrews, you've been quiet. No just comments? We're ready to vote. I believe we're ready to vote. I want to make one more statement. Something Mr. Clark said some time back really resonated with me. If you're if you're going to if you're going to have development in your community, you need to have a developer. And um, the problem at Notre Dame is that Nobody's come forward until now that we know of. And the property's been vacant for maybe going on 20 years. So a city park perhaps or another school or something along those lines, but none of that has manifested. So what we're faced with now is a development proposal. And as Mr. Elberson said, it's exciting to see something happening in our inner city. Because I'm no big fan of suburbs. I like living in the city. So um, I think the commission is inclined, Ms. Daniels, to uh, let you make your case directly to these residents and come back to us in February. Unless I'm reading it, this thing wrong. Oh, we have to vote. Correct. Yeah, I know we got to vote. Mr. Okay, Robinson. any more discussion? Mr. Robinson, Ms. I McCullough. hear her say that they're invested right at fifty or sixty thousand dollars. I mean, if you've been in this business for a while, when you deal when you're dealing in tax credits, you're dealing with multi millions of dollars. So you can get your money back. You know, it won't be a loss. Yeah. I'm good. Uh, Mr. Clark, can you help uh, Ms. Daniels facilitate this meeting with, with the pastor? We will reach out to the pastor. As, as I shared with you, we board. attempted a neighborhood participation plan meeting and two people attended. So uh, that could have happened when we had that meeting, but no one attended. But we will do whatever is necessary to try to assist the two parties in connecting. Wait, wait, can I make a suggestion? Can I make, I, I, let me speak. I'll make a suggestion. She's in the room now, so once we deliberate what we need to do, we have 20 people that came here today for and against this, this, this project. So she has a chance to meet these folks face to face. She can talk to the pastor and she can set this stuff up. This thing up. You know, uh, the property's been sitting there for a while. Something needs to be done. Now they can give their input on what they want to see. You know, uh, I'm not knocking anything because I like it when new development comes to a city. But one thing, I just want to make this last comment the, for the community out there that's out there. Y'all came down here very strongly today. I listened to the, the neighbors with blight and the, the, the slumlords and all that kind of stuff. Have that same energy with those slumlords, okay, because those are the ones that's killing the community. And the city's doing something about it, trying to do something about it now. But they need your help. Y'all yep. know who these people are. Find out who they are. Talk to them. Find out. Let them know what your vision is. Not only when we have new developers to come in to try to do something. And so that, and I, I just want to leave that there because we're open for business here at the MPC. And we want to make, make sure we do the right thing for the city of Shreveport and, our, and, our, and, our, and the people of Shreveport. So... Uh, once this meeting's over, we get with the young lady. But then moving forward, another thing, get your neighborhood association together because y'all are strong as a people. Y'all are strong as a people because you sit down here in this meeting this long to talk and to, to, to talk about this whole project. So get your association together so things can move a little bit better. Thank you. And Mr. Robinson, it wouldn't be a bad idea if the pastor, if he says he's going to assist in facilitating 
the community meeting, it wouldn't be a bad idea if you would get names and contact numbers of the people that are present here tonight, because if not, yeah. you might lose some of those people. Care. So yeah. a name and contact address, if you could do that, get you, designate you somebody, say, look, let's get everybody's name in opposition here tonight, your phone, if not your address, your phone number, quickly. I'm famous. Okay. Is there a motion on the floor? There's a motion on the floor. Motion on the floor to delay until February. Second. All in favor, please vote your machines. We had already. I thought Yeah, we had already motion and second. Yep. It was just voting. Well, we, we didn't vote. We just voting on it. No, we didn't mm -hmm. vote. Okay, raise your hand if you're in favor of the delay. Raise your hand if you're opposed to the delay. Okay, that's an eight to one vote. Mr. Andrews in opposition. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Daniels. Members of the audience, we appreciate you coming today. I believe uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. No, 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 we got business. Hey, we still got agenda items. Oh, I'm sorry. Speedy Gonzalez. And I thought we were done. <laughs> no, we got old business on the back. Okay, I'm sorry. Happy New Year, y'all. Okay, any old business? I'm hoping for old business. None. Any new business? Staff has absolutely nothing, Mr. Chair. Mr. Clark? We have nothing to report. Uh, no director's report. Uh, any public comments? We've heard plenty. I think that was one public comment. Yes, sir. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the commission, my name is Marvin Muhammad, uh, 1116 uh, Prospect Street. Um, I'm going to uh, speak very succinctly uh, concerning, I believe, an issue that that would that these that this commission has taken upon has taken upon themselves, and that is with the city of Shreveport uh, rental code. Um, and I was urged by several residents as the legal redress chair for the NAACP to come and speak uh, just this past week at the Fairmont Hotel, um, if you can call it that. There were um, just unlivable conditions that was, that was exposed. Um, at the corner of Gilbert and Stoner in a multi-family unit uh, named the Country Corner. There was a fire to one of the units because of substandard wiring that then eventually led to the uh, displacement of uh, multiple families uh, right before Christmas. Uh, no lives was lost in that fire. But however, the whole uh, six to eight uh, unit compound was shut down by the city, by, the, by, by of course by the city officials because it was just, uh, it was unlivable. And uh, those other residents would, be, would, would have been at risk. So I implored this uh, commission to really look into the slum conditions in the city of Shreveport. Um, I think what we heard today speaks into that. In these neighborhoods, we have, unfortunately, homeowners that doesn't have the disposable income to maintain homes. As a contractor, I can tell you that I probably have done maybe 20 to 30 plumbing jobs because of the winter storm. And most of the people didn't have the dollars to, to do the repairs just to get their water restored because of their pipes were busted. It was sad. And some of these homes, the landlords wasn't even willing to pay. Uh, I'm a small contractor. I'm not, I'm not gonna call into those big boys, but some of those, those prices that they was being quoted, they, it wasn't even in the picture. So, but, but specifically, uh, I would hope and pray that this commission would really look at the slum conditions in the city of Shreveport. 
these slumlords, not landlords, but these slumlords must be held accountable. Uh, as they said, uh, in these blighted areas, uh, residents, citizens of this city are being forced to live in substandard housing because that's the only place they can afford to live. I appreciate the opportunity uh, for your listening. Thank you. Mr. Clark, hasn't that uh, uh, program been forwarded to the council for approval? We, the council adopted a residential rental, residential registration, excuse me, uh, code that was submitted to him from you, fr to them from you. Uh, there are laws on the books now to address everything that Mr. Muhammad is talking about, and it's done through the Department of Property Standards. Uh, as the year unfolds, we will be working with uh, the Department of Property Standards. We're in the process of getting the uh, residential properties registered at this point. But uh, you know, as far as those uh, issues that he's talking about that are, that are in such high demand, property standards is already in place to address those issues. Okay. Any further business? Mr. Chair, move it, uh, Mr. Second. Andrews moves for adjournment. You got a hammer somewhere. Mr. Moss. Where's that, <laughs> Where's that hammer? Right there. Right there. There's that hammer. Okay. Uh, any opposition? Hearing none? <laughs> We're adjourned. <laughs> Thank you.